Alright, so here we go. The ship is going down by the bow, and it is, well, it is mostly underwater at this point. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Recreating the Disasters. Today, we're focusing on the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. So yeah guys, let's get into the video. Alright, so here we have the Edmund Fitzgerald, and yeah, Jake Hillen, do you want to give us a bit of backstory to the ship, at least up till this point? Yeah, so the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, invested in the iron and minerals industries on a large-scale basis, which called for the construction of the Edmund Fitzgerald. In 1957, they contracted Great Lakes Engineering Works of River Rouge, Michigan, to design and construct the ship within a foot of the maximum length allowed for passage through the soon-to-be-completed St. Lawrence Seaway. The ship's value at the time was around $7 million, which would be the equivalent of $57.6 million in 2022. More than 15,000 people attended Edmund Fitzgerald's launch ceremony on June 7, 1958, though the event had many misfortunes. When Elizabeth Fitzgerald, who was the wife of Edmund Fitzgerald, tried to christen the ship with a champagne bottle, it took her three attempts to break it. A 36-minute delay followed when the shipyard crew struggled to release the keel blocks. When the ship was finally launched, the ship created a large wave that drenched the spectators and then crashed into the side of the pier before stabilizing. And because of this sudden incident, Witnesses swore that the ship was trying to climb right out of the water in which a spectator actually suffered from a heart attack and soon died as a result. The Edmund Fitzgerald carried taconite ore from the mines near Duluth, Minnesota to iron works in Detroit, Toledo, and other Great Lakes ports. On November 9th, 1975, at 2.15 p.m., the Edmund Fitzgerald left Superior, Wisconsin, captained by Ernest M. McSorley. All right, so thank you, Jake Ellen. We're gonna wait here a little bit because it is the middle of the night and not in the afternoon when it really departed. And we're also in New York City because there is no Superior, Wisconsin. There's just New York and that's sort of the closest area. So um, yeah, we're just gonna wait here until it's the right time and then we're gonna leave. Well, the morning is about to arrive very soon and a storm's actually blown in, which is a little bit fitting. But in reality, we'll get into this in a little bit. The storm actually wasn't there when they departed, only later in the voyage. So, um, yeah, pretty interesting. Now, Jay Killen, was the Edmund Fitzgerald just a single-built ship, or did it have other sister ships to go with it? Yeah, so the Edmund Fitzgerald was the first of two similar sister ships constructed, the other being her sister Arthur B. Homer of 1960, constructed for Bethlehem Steel. So yeah, that's really cool. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna wait here just a little bit longer until it's time for us to depart. And then we will depart for the, well, the Great Lakes. I mean, we're trying to pretend this is the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, it is not. There is no Great Lakes in game yet. Maybe there will be in the future. I don't know. But we're just gonna wait here and once the time comes around to leave, we will leave. All right, so it's about time that we get going. So we're gonna go ahead and we are going to depart and make our way out into the Superior Lake. So uh, let's go. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm just maneuvering myself to the left here so we can make our way out to the open lake here. Obviously, we're near the land and everything. We don't want to be near the land. We want to make our way towards our destination. And what would that be again, J. Cullen? Yeah, so she was en route to the steel mill of Zug Island near Detroit, Michigan, carrying a cargo of 26,535 tons of taconite ore pellets. And that's a lot of weight, so the ship would be sitting a little lower in the water, actually a lot lower in the water, than it would normally sit unloaded. So, just something to keep in your head when you realize that the ship was going to go into some huge waves. Now, Jake Cullen, what was the weather going to be like on Lake Superior that evening? Yeah, so the weather forecast was not unusual for the month of November, and the National Weather Service actually predicted that a storm would pass to the south of Lake Superior by 7 a.m. on the following day. So correct me if I'm wrong, does that mean that there was going to be no serious, serious weather until earlier that morning? Well, as it turns out, the National Weather Service actually altered its forecast at 7 p.m. to issue gale warnings for the entirety of Lake Superior. Oh, wow. So... Things were starting to build up, ramp up a little more as time went on. They actually altered it, which isn't too uncommon, right, for the National Weather Service? Yeah, this actually led the Arthur M. Anderson and Edmund Fitzgerald to alter their course northward to hopefully seek shelter along the Ontario shore, where they then encountered a winter storm at around 1 a.m. on November 10th. So, wow, they were actually avoiding a storm, and they ended up going into another storm, which, again, is not too uncommon. It's just unfortunate that that was the situation that they were in. Nothing they couldn't seriously handle, 
but it is a storm after all on the Great Lakes. It's going to be a bit intense. Yeah, so the Edmund Fitzgerald actually reported winds of 52 knots or 60 miles per hour with waves reaching as high as 10 feet. Wow, okay, so we're talking about some serious conditions there. Now, I do see you off in the distance, and what ship are you in? I know you're in the Edmund Fitzgerald, but you're representing another ship that was there during the sinking. Yeah, so at around 5 p.m., the Edmund Fitzgerald joined a second freighter that was named the Arthur M. Anderson, which was captained by Jesse B. Bernie Cooper, and it was heading to Gary, Indiana, out of Two Harbors, Minnesota. Now, in reality, the ships were not this close as you see. They were much farther apart, around 15 miles. So this is just to represent that both ships were near each other, and I say that in quotations, when this whole event took place. Now, eventually, they both ran into the pretty serious weather we were just talking about. And then what happened next, Jay Killen? Yeah, so it was reported that Captain Paquette of Wildred Sykes overheard Captain McSorley say that they had reduced speed as a result of these rough conditions. And Captain Paquette also overheard Captain McSorley state, We're going to try for some lee from Isle Royale. You're walking away from us anyway. I can't stay with you which stunned him actually since McSorley wasn't known for turning aside or slowing down. And at 2 a.m., the National Weather Service upgraded its warnings from a gale to a storm forecasting winds of 40 to 58 miles per hour. So yeah, at this point, you can tell things are not looking good. I mean, obviously, we've got calm weather here, but in reality, it was a lot worse. Now, you can see that the Arthur M. Anderson is passing me, and now we're going to be behind them. And of course, we are way closer together than we would normally be, but we're just doing this so that you can understand what was actually happening. Yeah, so speaking of that, until then, the Edmund Fitzgerald had been following the Arthur M. Anderson, which had been traveling at a slightly slower speed, which allowed the Edmund Fitzgerald to pull ahead of it at around 3 a.m. So yeah, at this point, I am now going to move from, instead of being behind him, back to in front of him. So originally, I was in the forward position. He switched to being in front of me. And then now I'm switching to be in front of him. And of course, we're doing this at accelerated time because we're trying to compress this into a sizable video where you can just watch it and go on about your day instead of having to watch a full-blown documentary. If you do want to watch a documentary, here are some great documentaries in the top right corner. I would highly recommend them. Anyways, we are now in front of the Arthur M. Anderson. And yeah, again, this is in massive mile distances, not this close. So there we go. We are now in front of the Arthur M. Anderson. Now, a storm is one thing, but flooding plus a storm? Oh, wow, that's not good. And the Edmund Fitzgerald was getting into that situation. At around 3.30 p.m., Captain McSorley had radioed the Arthur M. Anderson to report that the Edmund Fitzgerald was taking on water and had lost two vent covers, as well as a fence railing, and that the vessel had developed a list. Two of the six bilge pumps were running continuously to discharge the flooding water, and Captain McSorley also relayed that he would slow his ship down to allow the Arthur M. Anderson to catch up and close the gap. So yeah, we do know that the Edmund Fitzgerald was beginning to take on water. They were running these pumps, they were trying to get the water out, but there was a lot of water coming in. But we don't exactly know from where, as that was never specified. So what happened next? Yeah, so eventually the U.S. Coast Guard warned all ships that the Sioux Locks was closed and that they should seek for a safe anchorage. McSorley reported a radar failure and asked the Arthur M. Anderson to keep track of them. The Arthur M. Anderson directed the Edmund Fitzgerald towards Whitefish Bay and then contacted the U.S. Coast Guard to inquire whether the Whitefish Point light and the navigation beacon were operating. The U.S. Coast Guard replied and said their monitoring equipment indicated that both instruments were inactive, so McSorley then hailed any ships in the Whitefish Point area to report the state of the navigational aids. Captain Cedric Woodard of the Ava Fours answered that the Whitefish Point light was on, but the radio beacon was inactive. So yeah, now not only is the ship taking on water, not only are they in a storm, but they've lost their radar. So now they're sailing blind. They don't know where they are exactly, and this is getting very, very worrying for the crew on board the Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, so since the charts and maps ended up being inaccurate, Six Fathom Shoals off of Caribou Island ended up being around one mile east of its actual position, which put the Edmund Fitzgerald closer to it than anticipated. Since the strong storm previously disabled the radar, having to have the Arthur M. Anderson to help track them, it made it more difficult to calculate their actual position according to the charts. The captain transmitted the following call, which said, I have a bad list, lost both radars, and am taking heavy seas over the deck, one of the worst seas I've ever been in. 
The last message transmitted by the captain was, we are holding our own, for the Edmund Fitzgerald was never heard from again. All right, so here we go. The ship is going down by the bow, and it is, well, it is mostly underwater at this point, and it's about to break in half as well. There it goes. The ship is broken in half, and it has gone to the bottom. Now, you may think that is way too fast, but in reality, it probably was this fast. There was no time for a mayday call. It was just gone within probably seconds or not even a minute. Now, Jake Hillen, what was presumed to have happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald when she sank? What caused it and what happened when she finally went down? What made it go so fast? Yeah, so like what was mentioned, the events of the sinking are widely unknown and based purely on what little we know currently, as well as theories and speculation. A possible theory is that the Edmund Fitzgerald unexpectedly and unknowingly ran aground on the rocky shoals near Caribou Island, causing the ship to take on water like what was reported. Eventually, it would reach a point where the bow would dip below the waves but not be able to float back up, causing the ship to quickly dive down and strike bottom, forcing the ship to fracture and buckle in the center. The bow breaks off and hits bottom upright, while the stern pivots past vertical and sinks to the bottom, landing upside down. So yeah, that is the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald in Tiny Sailor's World. If you guys have enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and a comment, and I'll see you next time, guys. Goodbye.